Well, it is a, it's a, can everyone hear me? Is volume okay? Great. Uh, I mean, it's great to be here and, and to realize that as we look at familiar faces, uh, some of us with graying hair, some of us with receding hairlines, uh, a lot of people looking absolutely wonderful. I mean, the, you know, the, the expertise and the experience of having worked with not only people here in front, but also uh, Scott, Alice, uh, Regina, Incho. Um, I think CCIP at the time when I came on board, I was fresh out of graduate school, I'd done a couple of years of community organizing, and there was, a, I think, a reasonably good legal infrastructure, and I think Craig provided a, a wonderful introduction, but one of the things that I, I, I think in historically is worth acknowledging, having a progressive mayor at the time did make a huge difference because the city, uh, now we have the city and the state uh, being fairly progressive on immigration policy, not necessarily on other things, but at that point, I think it was unique. I don't think there were other big city mayors with the perspective of Harold Washington. And as an organizer, you know, I think in, in a way, uh, Craig, Craig told the story of A.D. Moyer. Well, I think A.D. Moyer did us a favor in many ways because every action begets a reaction. And the fact is that he was, uh, you know, he really, in many ways, usurped his power as, as local director. Uh, but I think created the seeds of a lot of, I know, resentment in the Latino community. There was very strong organizations, uh, United Network for Immigrant Rights, others that, uh, you know, pretty radical, pretty left-wing in their perspective, but, you know, AD, I think, really helped move their organizing agenda forward by making the issues of, of immigrants' rights pretty mainstream. Um, you know, in terms of some overall perspective and lessons learned, I think we, we may have actually in Chicago had the best infrastructure of any city in the country, but we still had a pretty limited infrastructure in many regards. Um, we had the city, we had the state, we had social service organizations, uh, but uh, we really didn't have a lot of community organizations at the table. Uh, there was obviously the city has a strong history of, of, of community organizing, and uh, those organizations really weren't part of uh, CCIP at the beginning. I think over time they did uh, become part of it. And I think part of that was because of the technicalities of the law, uh, a lot of community groups were reluctant to get involved in, in the legalities of it uh, because they were focused more on you know, access to education, uh, English language instruction, ultimately getting people citizenship. But I think that at the back end, and I'll talk about this in a moment, of IRCA, when everyone began to think, okay, what was this gonna mean? All these folks are gonna get permanent residence and potentially citizenship. I think that that's when there was more mobilization at the, at the grassroots level. Um, I think one of the things to mention is, you know, as CCIP first emerged, there had been, and I, I, I'm again recollecting here, the United Network for Immigrant Rights, a number of uh, activists, uh, Latino community leaders, Carlos Arango, Carlos Heredia, others, um, uh, who, uh, I think didn't really, in many ways, it didn't break bread with CCIP, saw CCIP as very mainstream, TIA, you know, uh, but at the end of the day, it, a little yin-yang isn't necessarily unhealthy to have groups who have different <coughs> perspectives, and I think that did play out positively. Uh, but more importantly, in many ways, and I think Craig hinted at this, and, and Galen really brought it out, and I think it was really fascinating to have uh, the evangelical community from a faith-based perspective at the table. Uh, there really wasn't a history uh, and again, if I'm wrong, some of you can tell me, but of you know, Latino, Eastern European, Asian, and African communities working together. Uh, in many ways, legal status and the way the government had treated people had separated the groups from working together. Uh, and only at the community level where there were community organizations was some of that work happening, but outside of you know, formal legal structures of immigration status. Uh, so the fact is that I think really it was one of the first times where you got Latino and the Polish community specifically working together because I think after the Mexican community, the Polish community was the one that benefited the most from IRCA. Um, and so Polish Welfare Association ended up being a very active player in, uh, in originally in CCIP, then CCIRP. And I'm not sure where things stand today, but I think, you know, and again, Craig reminded me to even bring in the Irish community as well. There were some really interesting cross-cultural connections that were being built at the time. Um, I do have to say hats off to someone who many of us know well, he's not here today, to, uh, to Sid Moan at TIA, because one of the things Sid did is connect the dots at the national level, and um, uh, some of you work with currently or have worked with foundations. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, having an infrastructure is required on resources, and, uh, and the Ford Foundation, I think, nationally really stepped forward, and what's really interesting is uh, what had happened, and I came into this so I didn't fully understand it, had no knowledge of nonprofit fundraising, but got the fact pretty quickly that, you know, Ford was funding some work in Chicago, but also in other cities, 
uh, in New York, uh, in, uh, in uh, Boston, in San Francisco, in LA. Some of those organizations, I think coalitions still exist, CHURLA, yep. New York Immigration Coalition, Massachusetts Immigrant Rights Advocacy Coalition, uh, and having uh, a funder in one respect from an investment perspective, but more importantly, creating some cross communication in different cities was really important. Uh, and so it was really neat that, um, that there, one, there were some resources to do the work, to do the coalition building, but not just to focus on Chicago, to begin to build uh, at the national level. Uh, and so uh, we, a number of us were pretty involved. Uh, I think Sid at the time had been on the board of the National Immigration Forum. I ended up going on it. Uh, and I think the, again, and Craig talked about the Lawyers Guild meeting, I believe the two real, if I had to think, I mean, ALA was around, but I will say ALA in Chicago wasn't that big a part in, uh, in IRCA. It only came in largely more afterwards, uh, but that the National uh, Lawyers Guild, uh, you know, Ever the Activist was really important around immigrant rights work. And then the National Immigration Forum as a DC convener uh, that really helped, and, and Galen talked about this too, is uh, at looking at, okay, so we have a law that allows people to legalize, but what happens afterwards? And I think having the connection to policymakers at the federal level, uh, we did have a, um, you know, the, the one connection, I think, uh, in terms of a federal elected official who was quite strong on this was Senator Paul Simon. Uh, Simon sat on judiciary, uh, and I think, again, one of those things that I know C uh, ICIR does to this day is, you know, you leverage your local relationships with elected officials to affect national policy. And I think while Senator Simon certainly was not as progressive as Representative Gutierrez, there was a real sense that IRCA was a first step forward in understanding that more work would need to be done. Um, so uh, the strong connection, I think, to the national state, to the national level work was, was really important. I remember one of the things that was really interesting too at the time, uh, while certainly in the formal structure of CCIP at the time and then CCIRP, we didn't have unions, we began to build some relationships through the national level with, uh, then it was the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, which is now Unite HERE. And I think that sense, you know, that, that unions could be an ally in this work as well. I think unions generally had been involved in uh, kind of rear guard action when there were raids in, in fighting back against the, the excesses of the immigration service. Um, and uh, Galen did mention, you know, the, the private sector actors, those motivated by profit or by altruism, but in many respects maybe misplaced altruism because sometimes bad advice is worse than no advice. Uh, and the fact is we, we were able to, through documenting some of the ongoing problems during the IRCA legalization stage, to then get in place uh, the first ordinance regulating notaries in the city, which I think has then been strengthened. Uh, and I think that's an unfortunate aspect in many ways of uh, any law is that there just are always going to be bad actors who are going to create problems, and so trying to stay ahead of the curve uh, is, is really important and a lesson learned. Um, so a few things, uh, one more thing to highlight on a positive note, then maybe a few weaknesses, just in the sense that these are lessons learned. Um, what, what I was amazed at, and, was, and I think we got really good in the last three to four months before the application period ended under IRCA, was the critical importance of the ethnic media. Uh, that in many ways, uh, and I don't think TV, at that point, I don't think Telemundo or Univision, there wasn't, there wasn't a major TV presence. Maybe one of, the, one of them was in Chicago, but I think the radio stations were huge and in, the, in, the, in all of the ethnic communities. In fact, I mean, it is always amazing still to this day, you turn the dial at <laughs> AM and you hear other languages spoken a lot more than you see, than hear English. Uh, and so the realization that, oh my goodness, these people have live radio shows they have the, the, the risk, they could be giving out bad information, but I know a lot of us, especially who were bilingual or spoke multiple languages, would spend a lot of time going alive on radio shows to do informational interviews and to steer people towards larger community meetings, and, but also to kind of make people aware of some of the issues uh, so they didn't you know, falsely uh, file papers. So what were, what were some other lessons learned just from a weakness perspective? I think, you know, we have to be honest, look at this panel. We're all white. Uh, and uh, and uh, I, think, I think there was a definite, um, the leadership at the beginning of CCIP was overwhelmingly Caucasian. Uh, nothing wrong with that, but I think it was important to acknowledge at a certain point as we grew that the communities we represented were not. And I think in many ways, uh, you know, it was a weakness that we didn't have uh, strong, uh, especially I think Latino leadership from the very beginning. Maldef certainly institutionally was a player, but more as an organization, as part of building the coalition and focusing on some of the legal issues. Um, I would add Esther Lopez 
Yeah, Esther staff, was, yeah, was very huge, huge, hugely important. Yeah. Yes. But I think, so that was right. But but she was in the structure of TIA where she had a position that yeah. wasn't Sid Moen's position. So, yeah, yeah. But, but and totally Esther, Esther, who was probably one of the best organizers around, and in many ways, you know, I think gets some, a lot of the credit for her work as well. But I think I think we just looking in the mirror. I think that's that's kind of an issue. I think one of the other things was as we began to realize, uh, and this really became a focal point when I then took leadership role in building uh, ICIRP at the time, uh, that the suburbs were really important. We were strong in the city. Bernadine reminded me Catholic Charities had a nice network in the suburbs. But a lot of immigrant communities were growing out in Melrose Park and Waukegan and Elgin and other places, and we did not have much of a presence there. Uh, and, and in fact, there were the civic infrastructure to support uh, immigrant rights was just not present. Um, and uh, and then you know, other than Senator Simon, we really didn't have other local congressional connections. And so I think that idea of you know, and it is it is an oddity of all oddities when you think of the fact that. You know, Simpson, Mazzoli, Kentucky, and Wyoming, uh, two states that had the least number of immigrants. As I jokingly said to Lawrence, I mean, literally, we'd say, hey, who, who's, what's the immigrant constituency for Senator Simpson? Well, a bunch of Basque shepherds in the mountains of Wyoming. That's the extent of it. Uh, that being said, you know, I think, I think uh, ICIR over the years has gotten much smarter, and I think that the need to build those political connections at the uh, city and state level and at the federal level has clearly been a big victory. Uh, so I think there are, there, are there are big lessons learned here as much from the victories as much as maybe some of the weaknesses or the things that did not go so well. And so I look forward to being part of more of a discussion and I'm going to take it back over to you.